Yeah, thanks so much for having me. Yeah, so as mentioned, I'm Kelly Davis. My title is Cultural Heritage Data, Data Engineer at uh, Yale. Um, I'm going to talk today about Yale's Lux project. I apologize if people have seen this presentation or a version of it before, um, but we, you know, we launched last year, so we've been doing a lot of talking around the sector. And I can also say right off the bat, I'm not going to talk for 45 entire minutes. I think I talk for a little over 30. Um, so there's plenty of time for questions afterwards. But to get started. So Yale has world-class cultural and natural history collections. They are spread across three museums, a dozen libraries and extensive archives here. So with such a variety of objects and possible scholarship, we have a challenge in how can we best connect you to our collections? Part of uh, Yale's university's mission statement includes goals such as teaching and learning with our collections, encouraging curiosity and engagement with our preserved heritage. But of course, there's a lot of challenges to these goals. So these museums, libraries, and archives that we have here, they're all different domains. They are all different viewpoints and they have different standards. The data uh, from these uh, collections is in at least four different systems. And the records in those collections are, are all rich in detail with implicit connections. So those are connections made by users based on their own knowledge but nothing explicit in the data, either not structured or not linked. So Yale decided that a unified platform capable of searching across these systems was necessary, but they faced even more challenges here. So we had a desire to go beyond a traditional user interface. We did not want a Frankenstein system with disjointed parts all stuck together. And we did not want to reinvent the wheel or replicate any existing systems. Most importantly, each of these units at Yale needed to continue to own their own data and be their own system of record. So we knew any cross collections platform that we came up with would not be replacing their existing system. However, we understood to best achieve the goals of our mission statement, uh, Yale would need some kind of unified platform. So Lux began with the recognition that everything is connected. For example, this fossil that was found by Benjamin Silliman was a Yale, uh, who was a Yale science professor. It's in the collection of the Yale Peabody Museum. Benjamin Silliman wrote to George Peabody. This archive uh, correspondence is in the uh, archives in the Yale University Library collection. Benjamin Silliman was then married to Harriet Trumbull. There's a portrait of her in the Yale University Art Gallery. And Harriet Trumbull was the niece of John Trumbull who painted this, which is in the Yale Center for British Art. So connections like this could have been made uh, by a user on their own with prior knowledge and by visiting all the separate databases here. But we were interested in making connections like this, both it's possible and explicit in one platform. Hence Lux, Yale's cross collections discovery platform launched June, 2023. So Lux is a single point of discovery for Yale's uh, cultural heritage and natural history items. So our collections include works of art, archives, books, scientific specimens, and other collection items held by the university, though physically in diverse locations. Lux also includes records for people, groups, places, and concepts, as well as events connected to items in Yale's collections. So Lux's mission is improving access to collections for teaching, learning, and research, and generating engagement via curiosity. Our audience is everyone, both students and staff, those highly familiar with the collections, but also very importantly, those who are not familiar. So Lux is a platform that could bring in a user who might be browsing for information on John Trumbull, the Revolutionary War painter, but end up on a fossil found by Silliman based, by, uh, based on connections that we've made explicit. So that serendipitous discovery is a real hallmark of our platform. And how did we do accomplish this? Um, a high level of trust and collaboration between these units, including a new cross collection organizational structure. We accomplished this via the technology of a knowledge graph, um, not a relational database. And of course, a lot of hard work that continues today. So hard work is a little bit self-explanatory, but to elaborate on the first two points of how we accomplish this, 
Um, first, trust and collaboration. So a little history, an idea for Cross Collections platform here began percolating in 2009 uh, with an initial Cross Collections platform for the museum collections only built in that year. Then at that time, they used some technology available to them like Solar, XML, and OA OAI PMH. For various reasons, this project was not maintained, but it did serve as a starting point and an experiment. The cross collections idea was really kicked into high gear when Susan Gibbons, who was previously Yale's university librarian, became vice provost for collections in 2019, and in 2020 hired Dr. Robert Sanderson. Um, he is my boss here, and his title is the senior director for digital cultural heritage. And his hiring and his joining Yale really began the creation of what is now Lux. Uh, he and I have positions that are quite unique in that we are not in any of these collecting units, but rather in Susan Gibbons' uh, office and the Vice Provost for Collections office, so that we remain neutral in terms of prioritizing any of these units over one, uh, one another. So in 2020, requirements for what is now Lux were created, and these are some of those requirements. So data must describe all collection items, as well as people, organizations, places, and subjects that they reference, to provide context for those items. There must be single normalized records for each item and referenced entity to bring information from across collections together and provide a hub page uh, for them in the user interface uh, through which the user can discover related items. And all significant fields of the underlying source records must be represented in a clear fashion in the shared data structure, representing the uniqueness and value of the different domains while enabling the presentation of a single coherent interface, ensuring that all the collections are well represented. So to support the creation of Lux, uh, CHIT or the Cultural Heritage IT Pillar was established and that brings together all of these collecting units. So a little bit more on the cross collections collaboration. There are several cross unit working groups created uh, that support the creation and maintenance of Lux. But in addition to the launch of this platform, the Cultural Heritage IT Pillar is beginning to take on new, uh, new projects, including one recently launched around analyzing and potentially consolidating environmental monitoring systems across the collecting units. So Yale has also supported this collaboration with the creation of several positions, including my own, uh, a soon to be hired data scientist in our department, as well as um, funding for student workers. So then to talk about the knowledge graph as a second way that we've been successful. So we use link.art as our data model for Lux. And this quote at the beginning is from Rob Sanderson, which describes link.art as a linked open usable data specification, collaboratively, collaboratively designed to work across cultural heritage organizations, allowing easy publication and use of our knowledge. And the emphasis here is very much on usability. And in fact, the linked art community might even call it loud instead of LOD, linked open usable data, because of how much value we place on usability in the ontology. So linked art is an adaptation of the CDOC CRM um, and thus follows its rules of inheritance and valid properties. So uh, the CDOC CRM is an internationally recognized standard for representing cultural heritage data. One of the key features that linked art inherits from the CDOC CRM is that it is an event-centric model. So we focus on events as the primary means of organizing and relating information. Instead of simply describing static objects or, or entities, like an artwork, person, or a place, as an isolated data point, the model emphasizes how these entities interact through events over time. Linked art does rely on the existence and use of the Getty's Art and Architecture Thesaurus for our core source of identity. So linked art is a cultural heritage specification. The Getty vocabularies are a cultural heritage specific terminology. So there's a strong correlation between what linked art is describing and the terms available in the GVP. So usability would be uh, one of the core principles of linked art. Usability is predicated on its audience and linked art's audience is developers. So hence, linked art is meant to be highly usable for developers, the people who are technically implementing the model. As a result of this focus, linked art has a target zone of completeness. 
It aims to make easy things easy and complex things possible without encoding all of that complexity into the model. A second core principle of linked art is interoperability, which is defined as the ability of computer systems or software to exchange and make use of information. I'm going to highlight semantic interoperability here, as in agreed upon conventions in vocabulary usage. For example, my concept of a painting would be the same as your concept of a painting. But I would also add that linked art aims for interoperability between collections and domains. It is a cross collection standard and is as appropriate for rare books and manuscripts as it is for paintings, fossils, or musical instruments. And indeed we use it for all of those things in Lux. So Lux is successful because of the adoption of this model. Yale uh, gave us the go ahead to innovate and take risks around a new paradigm of building connections using a knowledge graph, AKA linked open data. Uh, although most of you are, I'm sure are familiar with linked open data is it can be thought of as an opposition to a table like structure of most databases. It's a graph, the web of data points connected by relationships and linked art that centers around an event or activity. The activity would vary by domain or by class. For natural history, uh, it could be the collector's encounter with the object. For art museums and libraries, it's the production of the object or creation of the intellectual content of a book or a publication of a work. So I'll use one of uh, Yale's most famous uh, artworks here, Van Gogh's Night Cafe in the Yale University Art Gallery to just illustrate the production activity of that object. So there was an activity and it was the production of uh, Van Gogh's Night Cafe. What did it produce? Well, Van Gogh's Night Cafe. Who, Van Gogh, was the producer of this object? Where, he painted it in Arles in, Fran in France. When did he do it? In 1888. And how he did it via the technique of painting. So that's really the basics on how the data model works around an event uh, centric. And here is some more pertinent information on how we're implementing link.art in Lux specifically. So we have six top data classes. Um, that might seem like a small number, but um, in linked art, we tend to focus on a small number of classes and a large number of classifications. So six top data classes, which will correspond to the top level tabs you'll see when you perform a keyword search in Lux. So again, for usability and interoperability, we focus on that small number of classes, but infinite, no infinite number of classifications using the classified as property, which is available on all classes. And that's a way to achieve a lot more specificity when you're describing an entity. So when we in the Lux data pipeline get the internal data from the units, it's already in a link.artjson format. The mapping of the data from, for example, uh, TMS to linked art is incumbent on all the units, but I assist with this and provide feedback. And we're in constant iter iteration loops in improving this data modeling. So I will go more into detail on how, how each unit prepares their data for ingestion into Lux. So one key relationship in linked art is the equivalent property, which is how we connect the same records to each other. So the Yale University Art Gallery has a record for Picasso and the Yale Center for British Art has a record for Picasso, but if they're both equivalent to ULANS 5000-9666, the data pipeline can merge those records into one Picasso. Uh, and I will show how that works a little bit more in the demo. And another key thing, which I've mentioned already, we don't attempt to model every detail. So at this point, we look for commonalities across benefits. So the most benefit for the least effort. There's room for improvement here, but there's always gonna be a balance between completeness and usability in the data modeling. So each unit has a different way that they prepare their data to send to us for ingestion into Lux. Most of these units are using different systems of record to begin with. So there's not a one uh, good way to harmonize their Lux record creation processes. They've all been developed independently in the way that works best for them. All of the units except the Paul Mellon Center at Yale have enough in-house expertise to do this work themselves. Uh, the Paul Mellon Center works with Digerati to prepare their data. In terms of harvesting external data sources, uh, which we use heavily in Lux, it again depends on the source and how they made the data available. 
So we harvest in three different ways via a dump file, uh, an entire data set that we can grab, via act uh, activity streams, or via fetching individual records. During this harvesting of the external sources, we also build three indexes that are used during reconciliation. This is a graph of the data pipeline. So I'm gonna talk in depth about how we build Lux records via this pipeline. So Lux has a three tier architecture. I primarily work on the pipeline here. Um, the pipeline's written almost, almost exclusively in Python and uses software such as Redis and Postgres for our indexes and our caches. The middle tier in the front end, I'm not going to be presenting on. They are permit, written primarily in JavaScript. If you have questions about those parts, I can try and answer them, but the code for all three tiers is available on GitHub. So I will provide that later. To build Lux records, the data pipeline, harvest the records from each unit, either via a dump file or activity streams. We also harvest from around 25 external linked data sources, um, Getty vocabularies, Wikidata, Library of Congress, GeoNames, and more. Any data that's coming in that's not already in link.art format gets mapped and transformed at this point. Then it, uh, it goes through the reconciliation process to reconcile those multiple records talking about the same thing into one. This is probably the most challenging aspect for us. Then uh, the records at this point get unique uh, Lux URIs, and then they go through the merging process. That's when all those reconciled pieces that we, we know are the same as each other, we decide which pieces go into the finalized Lux record. That's probably the second of the most challenging aspects for us. And then when, once we have those singular Lux records, we load them into our backend database, MarkLogic. Uh, MarkLogic is the only proprietary part of Lux. We needed something that we licensed. Uh, we need something able to handle the volume of data that Lux contains and not slow it down to the point of breaking. So I will show you how performative it is in the demo. So more about reconciliation. So again, a very important part of Lux is its connections. And those are not connections just across Yale, but beyond New Haven, because we bring in data from external sources during data processing. This data provides much more information than internal records and can provide a basis for more efficient scholarship, scholarship like a one-stop shop. For example, some of the external sources we use range as far as the National Diet Library of Japan, to the Closer uh, to Home Library of Congress, and of course, Wikidata and the Getty Vocabularies. They cover a wide range of subject areas from a variety of viewpoints, and crucially are all available as linked data. So even if they're not in link.art, we can map them to that data model. And then just being in the knowledge graph as opposed to the tabular database allows reconciliation of those records to Lux. And it brings an expansive amount of information to our users. So that means that the Lux record for an artist in Yale's collection, Thomas Gainsborough, with works created by him and about him in the Yale libraries, as well as 265 objects produced by him, by him or after him in the museums, his person record contains information not only from those units, but also from seven external authoritative sources. And you see that here. This enhances his record considerably, combining the art gallery's knowledge of his birth and death locations with library records that contain Gainsborough's name in different languages, with an image of him from Wikidata, biographical and descriptive data from VIA, as well as uh, more information from three European national libraries and other sources. It's really an ideal example of how such disparate data sources can not only impact, but improve each other. So this linking is accomplished all programmatically in the data processing code. This reconciliation and the next step of merging reconciled information into one Lux record can be very challenging. It has to happen at scale to be of any use for us. I think we have 41 million records in Lux right now, but working at such scale means we work with a level of error. All data starts with humans and humans are imperfect. So data is thus imperfect. Uh, earlier today, I did talk more in depth about issues we have in equivalent URIs from data sources. Um, and it's currently a challenge that we don't have a very efficient solution for. So we're looking for ways to improve this. 
I'm going to go even more in depth on how reconciliation works in Lux. This is our reconciliation flowchart, which applies to all people, groups, concept, and place records. We do not run reconciliation on objects, works, or events, like exhibition events, um, though we have done some processing outside of this chart to enhance some of those records. Essentially, a record would come into the processing pipeline. Um, the data processing pipeline order starts with internal sources first. When the record comes in into the, uh, the reconciliation part, the pipeline code would check the record to see if it has any URIs in its equivalent property. If it does, and it hasn't already processed this match, it goes to the URI index that was built after harvesting uh, the sources. It starts a crawling process from that URI match out to any matches that URI itself might have. And it will do this until it has at least three equivalent URIs to connect to the record. And three is just an arbitrary number that we have set. If it can collect uh, three equivalent URIs just via URIs, it will consider itself done and move on to the next record. If it can't, it will try name reconciliation. And right now we do string match on primary names to a few name indexes, including the Library of Congress, Name Authority File, and uh, LCSH, and the Getty vocabularies. So if it can make a name match, then it's gonna try to crawl for URIs again, aiming for that magic number of three. And if it can't get three through either process, it fails and it moves on to the next record. So as you can see, uh, the code is somewhat sophisticated in the crawling and continued attempts to reconcile, but it is not sophisticated in that it cannot incorporate human knowledge into this loop. So everything here is happening in code. As I discussed uh, more earlier, this process can be error prone and it is a big challenge. So these are the current record counts, more than 41 million records total uh, that expand out to approximately 2 billion triples. As mentioned, Lux launched in June of 2023, so a little over a year ago, right when summer break was beginning here at Yale, which gave us some months of, of quiet time to roll out staff-focused training, which continues. And in fact, later this month, we're doing a linked data workshop to do further educational training uh, with internal stakeholders. Lux is used around the university in teaching and learning both by professors and as a tool librarians offer to students doing research. We also uh, recently in the past six months exposed Lux uh, to Google search crawlers and that massively impacted our visits, our page views and our unique visitors. So some of our recent, recent metrics over the summer, the three month period here, over 98,000 visits to a Lux page, uh, over 530 pages viewed, almost 90,000 unique visitors. 94% of visitors viewed more than three Lux pages in a single visit, which I think says a lot about how we're kind of keeping people engaged. And 83% of our traffic during the summer was driven from Google. So we have visitors from nearly every country on the planet. And if we're talking about how Lux has been received like within the community and maybe more metaphorically, I would say very well. So we've gotten an immense amount of interest from other institutions who are interested in doing what we've done and learning how we accomplished it. So I'm going to do a live demo right now. You can um, follow along. This is the Lux uh, landing page. So it, comes with a Google style search bar, bar, like a keyword search here, but it also has an advanced search, which is the ability to query the semantic knowledge graph. We do not offer a Sparkle endpoint and we don't actually have any plans to offer one at this point. We have a hero image that's rotating here, as well as rotating um, co highlighted collections. And then there's more information about what's here. There's some information up at the top about how we built this and some search tips that help. I'm gonna start with just a you know Google style keyword search and I'm gonna do it with Trumbull, which is a very common uh, word, name, place, people, et cetera, a thing here in Connecticut. So you can see immediately how responsive it is and that's by our use of Mark logic um, that it's able to do that search so quickly. 
because what it's doing is a just a total keyword search of Trumbull across all the text in all of the records. The results are weighted by how often the search term um, is found in the in the text of the record. So it defaults to the object tab if you've got object results, but you can see our those classes repeated here on the tabs, and I can click through them if I'd like. But I'm going to go ahead and use our facets to refine this search a little bit. So because this is a demo, we'll do has dis digital image. We will say we want objects that use oil paint that are portraits. We will do a little bit more refining on our dates here to make it circa 1800. And again, you're seeing how responsive it is. It's very quickly loading those facets. And then we've narrowed this down to 95 objects. I'm going to go ahead and click on one of them and show you an object page. So here, an object page. Uh, they, not all, but I would say 90% of them, especially from the art museums, have a IIIF image here with a viewer. And then you have some sort of classic um, information about the object. Where is it? The clickable links can bring you deeper into the collection and bring you around parts of Lux. What, what is it made of? Again, we'll bring you around parts of Lux. So if we were to click on wood, we would be in a concept page with all of the objects made of wood and any uh, intellectual works related to wood. And again, you're seeing a lot of this um, heavily, recon heavily, heavily, heavily reconciled information here on the right that's coming from the data sources, which will always be listed here on the bottom right-hand side of any page. But if we go back here and click on John Trumbull to see a person page, we now have that Wikidata image. We have more uh, reconciled information, including his birth and death places, occupations, etc. again, coming from our data sources. The left side of the people group concept and place records are always going to try to bring you back into the collection. So they'll have tabs like the objects that were created by this person, the works that were created, published, or influenced by them, and any works that have them as a subject. So these are all kind of collection objects that we have. I believe that the front end engineer is working on a better, you know, more interactive timeline than what we have here. But right now we do have timelines on these pages as well. And then I think the real power of um, the graph is here in our accordions. So we have events, you know, with objects created by him, groups that he founded, relate people who are related to him in some way, materials related, locations that are related to him in some way. So it's, maybe not producing like shocking results. Of course, we know Connecticut, New York, and the United States are related to John Trumbull, but we really see the power of the graph in, in these accordions. And again, the clickable links really show more of that power of linked data. So going to New York, which is a place page, we can see the objects that were made or encountered here, intellectual works published here, works about New York, as well as people who died here, events that took place here, which at this point are mostly going to be exhibitions, related people in groups. So you can start to see how um, very quickly, maybe an hour or two can go by, and you've just had a lot of fun clicking around uh, in Lux and bringing you to all kinds of places that maybe you never meant <laughs> to end up on, a little bit of like a rabbit hole. So I'm going to go and demo the advanced search now. When you click on advanced search, you have the option to choose one of the classes. So you need to start from somewhere when you're when you're qu querying the graph. Let's just search for objects. We're going to say we want all of these things. And we want an object that includes that uh, an intellectual work. And now we've moved into the work part of the graph. We want the work to be about someone, 
have the subject of someone. And now we moved into the people or groups part of the graph. And we want that person to have encountered, and now we moved into objects. Encountered is the linked art sort of parlance for fossil um, collecting. And we want that object to be categorized as a holotype. And a holotype is a single type specimen upon which the description and name of a new species is based. So now we've built a query that goes across several parts of the knowledge graph. I'm gonna go ahead and search. It's very quick in results. Well, what we wanna do is just ones that have images cause that's a little bit more interesting to look at. And what we end up here is paintings of scientists who discovered specimens um, that are in the collection of the Peabody Museum. So that's it for the demo, but again, it's live. So you're welcome to play around with it anytime. And as I'm wrapping up here, here's some links. The GitHub page has all of our, uh, the, all the tiers of the architecture available here. The documentation on the data model is available at link.art and again, the Lux, the Lux page. And you're welcome to get in touch with me anytime here with my email and my LinkedIn. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Kelly. That was a great presentation. Um, what, an, what a project, uh, so much data wrangling, but it, it all looks, you know, it all looks pretty incredible, like, you know, what we all are expecting uh, a linked data discovery should be like. So it's it's really come a long way um, in a short amount of time. Um, I see in the chat there's a question. Um, uh, do source records ingested into the system contain URIs or are these created in, in your system? Um, every record that we use has to have a URI. Um, we create the Lux records in the data pipeline, but, um, all of the internal and external sources we use, uh, yeah, they have to have a URI. And um, actually, as a follow up, uh, did you? I'm sorry. Did you say that? Um, does everything get a like a Lux URI minted um, in, in addition to all the external URIs? Okay. Yeah. So the external uh, in the UI, you're only going to see those in the data sources. Mm -hmm. um, but when they come in, they you know when we harvest them, they're that's how we identify them as their URI. Um, and then, you know, during the reconcil after the reconciliation process, then then there's a re-identification process that gives everything a new Lux URI as well. Um, and yeah, those are they're the sort of concordance is managed in Redis. Okay. Well, we are getting uh Several questions are coming now in the chat. So uh, Emily asks, how do you distinguish between objects and work? Oh, the the, quint the great question, yes. <laughs> uh, it's a little obtuse, to be honest. Um, linked art and the CDOC CRM distinguish physical objects from intellectual works so that a physical object like a painting would carry a visual work. Um, I think the example that's used a lot is like the Mona Lisa. So there's a physical painting, the Mona Lisa, that carries the visual work of the Mona Lisa, but that visual work of the Mona Lisa can be carried by other physical items. Um, whereas a physical work like can carry multiple visual items, can carry multiple, multiple textual works. So a book would, uh, a physical book would carry uh, intellectual content that is the work. So Lux does... We, we have to maintain that difference for the model, you know, for engineering purposes, it's extremely important. For the UI, I think it's it, more often than not tends to be kind of confusing for users, but we're working, we've done a lot of work in trying to make that more explicit. And this is a distinction that is carried in, in so many link, uh, link data models as well, um, that I think is a, is a bit of a challenge, but we've talked, we talk a lot about if there's a way to collapse it actually in the Lux UI, 
So that might happen at some point in the future, but right now it's a, it's sort of an educational challenge. Yeah, it's a bit, there's other areas where that can get tricky too, like genre form. And so a lot of things are, are a little tricky sometimes. Um, so another another question uh, from chat is, what tool did you select to create this uh, project? Uh, we made it all in-house except for the proprietary database that we use, which is called Mark Logic. So the pipeline code is is mostly Python. Um, you know, classic kind of data engineering ETL pipeline. Um, and we use Postgres and um, Redis for data caches and for indexes in the pipeline. And then the the middle tier and the front end, I think primarily use JavaScript, uh, React, it's a React app. Okay. Um, and moving right along uh, in the questions. So, uh, but um, actually to the previous question, um, I did drop the GitHub link uh into the into the chat and it's on the slide there so um is the pro would you say that the project is largely open source except for you know a couple of those proprietary um elements yeah, yeah it's all open source except for mark logic um i i you know i think that can you know conceptually we would love to have it be a hundred percent open source, but the volume that we have, we needed something that could handle it. And we haven't found an open source project that is both a triple store and a JSON um, document store that can handle the volume that we have, but we're, we're still looking at options. Great. And yeah, thank you also uh, for uh, clarifying a bit what the Mark Logic is, is doing there. So it's, you know, when you have a giant database of triples, you need somewhere to put it, so. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah, it, it's extremely performant, and I think uh, it's used by a lot of really large organizations as as well. Um, and uh, one more question from chat is, um, is there user testing being done on the facet labels? And uh, just uh, with the specific question about like whether things like encounter date is clear to all users. Yeah, I think like help text is really important across Lux as we work on kind of making what it's doing and what your, you know, what the queries are doing and everything are a lot more clear. Yeah, there there's a UX designer on, I mean, Yale has a UX um, team as part of ITS. There are kind of central IT service here that we, you know, we work with and they're always doing different testing with stakeholders and with the with the staff and, and students and, and so forth. Um, and there's a whole kind of feedback mechanism on that. So yeah, we definitely have, we've made a lot of improvements. I think we're, you know, it's, it's an iterative process. We're always going to be kind of tweaking and changing things. Okay. Could you talk about any, uh, changes you made based on like user feedback, whether it was internal or external, or I guess, I guess, uh, I don't know if you've done like totally like outside of Yale, but I guess uh, in terms of like uh, y like Yale users who aren't employed by like the museums or the libraries or those units. I'm not sure. I don't actually, I'm not actually a part of the UX, um, you know, research that's going on, but I know there's a lot of documentation available on it that I could find. Um, I mean, yes, I think it's a lot of label changing is that, and so it's usually a front end change as opposed to some kind of data change. Um, so sort of a, a design kind of change in some way, something that, um, this is not exactly UX, but we've had challenges with, um, getting archives to sort properly. Uh, so like a finding aid structure, of course, is very important on, um, you know, the original order, uh, when find, when the archives finding aid structure first went into Lux, the front end you know, engineers who are not familiar with archives simply alphabetized everything. Um, so of course we had a lot of feedback from our archive stakeholders that that was incorrect. And so there's been a lot of work going on to try to get them to sort the finding aid properly. Um, not exactly UX, but, you know, we are in a constant kind of feedback loop with our, our stakeholders and, uh, 
internally they have a way to submit bugs, but even externally, every Lux page has a submit feedback button that comes to us for review. Okay, great. That's a great feature to have. Uh, and I'm sure you get a lot of good, good, good feedback from that. Uh, Richard Urban asks in chat, um, you know, regarding this UX work, has it been published anywhere? Published? I don't think so yet. Um, not, you know, externally. Um, I'm not sure if they've presented on it before. Um, but yeah, there is definitely, you know, UX um, research going on around it, but prior to launch, of course, for some time, but also continuing. All right, well, we have time for maybe one more question. Um, if anyone wants to drop anything, I'm not seeing any new questions in uh, Slack. Oh, here comes something uh, about John Trumbull's works are in public domain. Um, uh, does it matter for Lux? Um, so if it's owned by Yale, the data is open uh, um, access. Um, in terms of some other parts, uh, well, I would say that most of the time it's open access. Every record in uh, Lux, every object and work record has a um, like availability copyright kind of section on it that will give more information on that specific object. But we do pr place a pretty high priority on kind of open access data in Lux and everything we're using is available in the ecosystem. Okay, one more. Uh, this is, I think this is a good one. And we we do have one more minute left in our allotted time. Do Lux records get updated when source records are updated? And you talked a bit about this earlier today and some of the, how this gets tricky, but uh, yeah, I'm curious to hear about that. Yeah, I wish. Uh, no, <laughs> we're on a maybe two, it depends. It depends on the source. Um, we update the, you know, we, we run a, a that we're running the data pipeline all the time, but in terms of what's actually making to, to promotion, I would say we we aim for a two week promotion schedule, but that's somewhat independent of when we're getting new data from any of the units or any of the external sources. Um, trying to keep things in sync is, is a challenge for us. Um, part of it would require uh, more adaptation of activity streams, which is something that we could run harvesting nightly just to get things that have changed. A lot of the units still just send us a dump file of everything that takes quite some time to actually upload. And then we have to reprocess the entire pipeline. So kind of figuring out how can we not, how can we update some records, but not the entire thing is, is a little bit of a challenge. Because right now, um, when we run a new data set, when we create a new Lux data set, we basically start uh, from scratch. I mean, we we keep the reconciliation indexes around but we kind of re have to rerun all the data and we have it down now to like a two or three day, you know, just simple time it takes for the computer to process that amount of data. And that's just the pipeline. So the units are on their own schedules for in terms of when they're sending us new data and trying to harmonize all of that is, it's important, definitely. It's important for the users, but it's also really important for our stakeholders to see more kind of refresh of the changes that they're making showing up in the Lux record. Yeah, we, we um, you know, I think it was six or eight months from launch till we had a new data set in. <laughs> so that's a really long time, uh, but it's a little bit, it's become a little bit, it's more, freak, more and more frequent now as we're kind of working out some kinks in this process and um, running more kind of scripts to check when external sources need updating as well. Um, like Wikidata, for example, you know, we have traditionally gotten it as a giant dump file. It takes a really long time but kind of looking at, oh, well, let's just get ones that have changed. And then let's just get ones we actually use, uh, things like that. So refining the process and the harvesting has is, is been happening over this past year. 